dear students in the previous class we have predicted the population mean with the help of sample mean where the condition was the sigma square is unknown. Now, no the sigma square is known. Now, we will see the next case where sigma square is unknown then we will see how to predict the population mean. For this purpose you have to use student t distributions. Consider a random sample of n observations with mean x bar and standard deviation s. From a normally distributed population with mean mu then the variable t is nothing but x bar minus mu divided by s divided by root n. You see that there is a connection between z, z we used to write x bar minus mu divided by sigma by root n. But in the t distribution what is happening? The sigma is unknown so we are going to, we are going to use sample standard deviation. The other thing is this n should be the smaller number it is less than 30. So, when will you go for t distribution? When sigma is unknown, when n is less than 30. Okay. Then the variable t equal to x bar minus mu divided by s by root n follows the student distributions with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Now, we will see how to predict the confidence interval for mu when sigma square is unknown. If the population standard deviation sigma is unknown, we can substitute the sample standard deviation s this introduces extra uncertainty since s is variable from sample to sample. So, we use the t distribution instead of the normal distribution. What is the assumption for the t distribution? Population standard deviation is unknown, population is normally distributed, if the population is not normal use very large sample. The student t distribution the confidence interval is x bar minus t n minus 1 alpha by 2 s divided by root n less than mu less than x bar plus t n minus 1 alpha by 2 s divided by root n. So, this also came from this t n minus 1 alpha by 2 this has come from this ex expression. So, when you readjust that this equations then we can get the lower limit upper limit for the population mean. So, if it is minus x bar minus t n minus 1 alpha by 2 s by root n it is a lower limit. If it is a plus x bar plus t n minus 1 alpha by 2 s by root n it is a upper limit. So, this can be written as like our previous z distribution x bar plus or minus m e this margin of error. So, this m e is nothing but t sigma by root n. Previously it was z sigma by root n, now it is t sigma by root n. Okay. Student t distribution, the t is a family of distributions because for every degree, degrees of freedom you will get a different t distribution. Okay. The t value depends upon degrees of freedom, number of observations that are free to vary after sample mean has been calculated nothing but degrees of freedom that is your n minus 1. Look at this connection between t distribution and z distribution. We start from the you see the flatter one t distributions are bell shaped and symmetric, but have flatter tails than the normal. So, when the degrees of freedom is see initially 5 it is a flatter when the degrees of freedom is 13 and so on you see when the degrees of freedom is infinity it is behaving like a z distribution. That is why in many in many software packages see there would not be any option for doing z test there will be option only for doing t test because when the sample size increases for the t test. So, the behavior of z distribution t distribution is same then we look at the students t table you said there is a difference between z table and t table. In z table whatever value which is given is the area, but in a t table you see that the area is given in the top say 0 0.05 the whatever value which is given inside the t table is that is a critical value. For example, if it is alpha by 2 is a 0 0.05 the corresponding t value is 2.920. So, the body of the table contains t value not probabilities we should be very careful. So, for example, 
n equal to 3 and degrees of freedom is n minus 1 2 alpha equal to 5 then alpha by 2 is 0 0.05. So, we have to see where the 0.05 in the column column line when degrees of freedom is 2 then we can see that is a 2.920. A kind of a comparison between t values and z values. First we will go for this one it is so familiar for us. When the confidence level is 95 percentage see the z value is 1.96. For different degrees of freedom you see that you see that when the degrees of freedom is 10 it is a 2.228, when it is a 20 it is 2.086 see that when t equal to 30 the degrees of freedom is 2.0. So, the value of t approaches z when n increases you see that initially it is increasing. So, it is starting you know it is getting decreasing and finally, it reaches 1.96. This table explains whenever the degrees of freedom is increases we are getting z is close to 1.96 for the t distribution. Now, we will see how to find out a confidence interval for a t distribution. An example is a random sample of n equal to 25 has sample mean is 50 and sample standard deviation is 8. Form a 95 percentage confidence interval for mu. The first one is we have to go for degrees of freedom. There are 25, so 25 minus 1 24. Here confidence level is 95 percentage. So, the significance level is 5 percentage. When I say it is a 5 percentage because it is the upper limit lower limit we have to divide by 2 it is uh, 2.5 percentage when degrees of freedom is 24 alpha by 2 is 0 0.025 when you look at the table the t value is 2.06. So, you substitute x bar equal to 50 t equal to 2.06 s is 8 and sample size is 25. So, you are getting lower limit of 46.698 upper limit of upper limit of 53.302 okay now we'll go to the next category finding the population proportion with the help of sample proportion confidence interval for the population proportion an interval estimate for the population proportion p can be calculated by adding an allowance for uncertain uncertainty to the sample proportion that allowance is nothing but your standard error. Recall that the distribution of the sample proportion is approximately normal if the sample size is large then standard deviation is your sigma p. Sigma p is root of p q by n q is nothing but 1 minus p. We will estimate this with the sample data. So, this is your sample standard deviation we can say standard deviation for sampling proportion root of p hat 1 minus p hat divided by n. Okay. To find out the lower limit upper limit of the population proportion we have to use the sample values because what will happen we may not know the population p value directly if you know population p value what is the purpose of finding lower limit and upper limit we know only the sample proportion. So, p cap minus z alpha by 2 root of p cap into 1 minus p cap divided by n less than p less than p cap plus z alpha by 2 root of p cap into 1 minus p divided by n. So, what is happening? So, with the help of your sampling proportions we can find out this value is a lower limit of your population proportion this value is your upper limit of your sampling proportion. You see that we with the help of sampling proportion we are able to predict there was a condition with the n p q should be greater greater than 5 then only it can be approximated to normal distribution. We will see an example a random sample of 100 people shows that 25 are left handed form a 95 percentage confidence interval for the true proportion of left handers. So, this problem the p cap is 25 divided by 100 z is 1.96 because 95 percentage confidence level all other p cap is given just you substitute this value 
there you put plus this side minus you getting the lower limit of population proportion is 0 0.1651 the upper limit of population proportion is 0 0.3349. How to interpret this? We are 95 percentage confident that the true percentage of left handers in the population is between 16.51 percentage and 33.49 percentage. Although the interval from point 1651 to 0.3349 may or may not contain the true proportion, 95 percentage of con intervals formed from the samples of size 100 in this manner will contain that is more important term. Another way you can say when you repeat this 100 times, 95 times you can capture the true population proportion, only 5 times you may not capture true population proportion. We will go to the last one, how to predict the population variance. So, so far what we have seen? We have predicted the population mean, we have predicted the population proportion, now we are going to predict the population variance. Uh, the goal is to form a confidence interval for the population variance sigma square. The confidence interval is based on the sample variance. So, what we are going to do? With the help of sample variance, we are going to predict the population variance interval. We are, we are assuming the population is normally distributed. We already we have seen that whenever there is a population is there, if you take some sample from there, when you plot the when you plot the sample variance that will follow chi square distribution, as I told you previously, it will be like this. Okay. This will be n minus 1 s square divided by sigma square. We are going to use this result when you readjust this, right? When you readjust this, so sigma square will be less than or equal to less than or equal to so this will become chi square 1 minus 1, this side it will become 1 minus 1 s square chi square n minus 1 here alpha by 2 here 1 minus alpha by 2. So, what is happening when you readjust readjust this equation when you readjust this equation for sigma square you can find out the upper limit and lower limit of population variance. Yes, the same thing the 1 minus alpha percentage confidence interval for the population variance is given by this one. You look at this, the left hand side is alpha by 2 because what will happen when you look at the chi square distribution, we have given only the right side area. When the right side area is alpha by 2, so what will happen? Here the we will get a bigger number. Suppose this was, this value is over, over 1 minus alpha by 2. So, here it will be a bigger number for example, say 5 it will be smaller number. When you numerator when you divide by bigger number it will become smaller value that will become the lower limit of our variance. The numerator when you divide by smaller value it will become bigger number that will become the upper limit of your population variance. We will see an example. You are testing the speed of a batch of computer processors you collect the following data sample size is 17, sample mean is 3004, sample standard deviation is 74. Assume the population is normal, determine 95 percentage confidence interval for sigma x bar square. Here sigma x square is nothing but lower limit, upper limit of the sampling variance. So, n equal to 17, then chi square distribution has n minus 1 16 degrees of freedom when alpha equal to 0 0.05 because it is we are finding upper limit lower limit we got to divide by 2. So, 0 0.025. So, when it is alpha by 2 it is 28.25. So, what will happen? This is the right side limit. When you want to know the left side limit you have to in the chi square table when area equal to 1 minus 0 0.025 that area you have to find out that probability 
when the degrees of freedom is 16, so corresponding value is 6.91. Okay. So, when you substitute this value 17 minus 1 s square is 74. So, this value is chi square value when it is alpha by 2 chi square value if it is 1 minus alpha by 2 we are finding the lower limit is 3037 and upper limit is 12683. Converting the standard deviation we are 95 percent confident that the population standard deviation of CPU speed is between when you take square root of this between 55.1 and 112.6. So far we have seen assumed that the infinite population sometime there is a finite population. Finite population is when the when the when the number of element in the population is small. Okay. If the sample size is more than 5 percentage of the population size and sampling without replacement then the finite population correction factor must be used in calculating standard error. So, we have to add this correction factor when we go for a finite population. When finite population will come? When the sample size is more than 5 percentage and we will go for without replacement. Suppose sampling is without replacement and the sample size is large relative to the population size, we should go for finite population correction factor. Assume the population size is large enough to apply the central limit theorem. So, apply the finite population correction factor when estimating the population variance. So, this factor capital N minus small n divided by n minus 1. So, capital N is population size, small n is sample size. Let the simple random sample of n be taken from the population of n members with mu. The sample mean is unbiased estimator of the population mean mu, then the point estimator is 1 by n divided by x bar. There is no problem for sample mean. When, when you are going for sample variance, we have to add this correction factor that is this, this correction factor has to be added. If the sample size is more than 5 percentage of the population size, an unbiased estimator for the variance of the sample mean is s square by n, you have to multiply this. So, 100 into 1 minus alpha percentage confidence interval for the population mean is this new sigma cap x bar square. So, this is applicable for population proportion also. When the population proportion is uh, population, when we are going to predict the population proportion, when the sampling proportion is larger and the uh, population proportion is finite, then you have to add another correction factor. Let the true population proportion be capital P. Let P cap be the sample proportion from n observation from the simple random sample. The sample proportion P cap is unbiased estimator of the population proportion n. So, here also we have to add this capital N minus small n divided by n minus 1 as a correction factor. All others are remaining same. Now, we will summarize what we have done in this class. Okay, we will summarize what we have done so far. In this lecture, we have created a confidence interval estimate for the proportions. Then we have created a confidence interval estimate for the variance of a normal distribution. For each proportion and variance estimations, we have, we have taken a numerical example to solve the problem to understand this concept of parameter estimation.